Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, I told you my least favorite word in the English language. Anybody who was here a couple weeks ago remember which word it is? <clears throat> love. Yeah, yeah, love. And I don't like the word love because we, we just don't get it. We just don't understand it. And so we throw it around, just kind of like throwing a coin in a wishing well, and you just don't really know what it means. Just kind of a thing. Just love this and love that and love this and love that. And I, I, love, <clears throat> I love my wife and my pizza, and I love my dog and my car. I don't have a dog, but I, I would love it if I had one. Um, can I have a dog? She didn't answer. Yes, I can get a dog. She still didn't answer. That's okay. We can love everything and yet love nothing at the same time. Love is a great and an awful word at the same time. And the reason the word love is so awful is because we don't understand its meaning. We've dumbed down the meaning of love to something that's super easy to attain, and we've made love about something it never, ever was supposed to be about. And so today, our goal, as we look at this letter that John wrote, one of the last things that John would have ever written, we're going to talk about love, and, and not the, the pizza kind of love, or the dog kind of love, or the car kind of love, but, but real love authentic love, genuine love, God's love. Now, interestingly enough, the very first time love is mentioned in the Bible, anybody have any idea where love is mentioned first in the Bible? Any Bible scholars who have the entire Bible memorized able to tell me where love happens first in the Bible? No? Genesis, good, good job, Genesis. It's mentioned first in Genesis in relation to Abraham. First time it's mentioned, Genesis 22, uh, I believe it's verse 2. Genesis chapter 22. I thought somebody was texting me the answer, but they weren't. <clears throat> Hi. Um, Genesis 22, the first time love is mentioned is Abraham with his son Isaac. God looks at Abraham and, and says to Abraham in Genesis 22, take your son, the son who you love, and do what? Kill him. For, you can say sacrifice, and that's the pretty way of saying kill your son for me. I mean, that's really what God was asking of Abraham. God said to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, the son you love, the only son you have, the one that means the world to you, because this is the son who's going to allow your name to go far beyond you. Take that one thing that means the most to you and kill it for me. If that's love, not sure I want it. But Abraham did some fantastic and amazing things. And in that moment, we don't see Abraham going, but, 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 but God, but God, but God, he's my only one. He's like the, the, the promised one. Like, how, no, but, no. Abraham gets his son, takes his son up to a mountain raises the knife as he binds his son to the altar and he's willing to sacrifice his own son. That's powerful. That's what God asked for. Are you willing to give up that which is most meaningful to you to demonstrate love? Now let's jump ahead into our text for this morning. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 is probably one of those passages most of us have heard at one point in time or another. You may have even sang the song that goes along with it. But uh, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. <clears throat> Now, our problem, I think, is we have misquoted Scripture. 
That's typically the problem in our lives. We get Scripture backwards. And, and I think what we've done in, in, our, in our day-to-day lives is we have, we have gotten this passage backwards. Because instead of saying that God is love, we live our lives saying that love is God. It's a totally different thing. God is love is not the same thing as saying love is God. We live in a world in which love is, has become a God to us. We want to feel loved. We want to experience love. We want to receive love. So we'll do anything to make love more known and visible to us. But if the object or the focus of love is yourself in any way, it's not God's love. If your love says, if you love me, you would, it's not the love God talks about. If your love says, but I thought you wanted to love, I thought you wanted me to feel love, I thought, I thought you wanted me. If, if, you, as an, if, if you are the object of your love in any way, it's not God's love. Look at what he says again. Beloved, and that's his way of saying believers, friends, people who think the same way I do, who call yourselves followers of Christ. Beloved, let us love one another. Not, not, not let others love us. Not, not expect other people to love you, but, but you love other people. You focus on the other person. Beloved, let us love one another. Let us exchange love back and forth, not loving to get it back, but loving for the sake of the other person. Let your love be genuine and true. Let it be others-focused. Let us love one another, for love is from God. Now, this is great. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. If you can't feel the love of God, you'll never know God. If you can't love others, you won't be loved by others. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. You see, the only thing that allows us to love one another is the fact that we have first received love. If you haven't been loved by God, you will never, ever be able to exchange love with anyone. It will be surface level, and it will be self-focused at best. You will have like, you will have infatuation, you will have one of the other words for love that's found in the Greek language, but you will not have God's love. Remember, there are four words for love in the Bible, or in the, in the Greek language. There's eros, erotic, which is that, that intimate kind of love between husband and wife. Then there's storge, storgeo, which is, anybody remember from a couple weeks ago? Family, good job all of you. Family love, <clears throat> nobody said it. Um, then there's phileo, which is Brother, yeah, y'all been to Philadelphia, haven't you? So just because there's no city named Storgel, Storgelphia doesn't mean, that's really awful to say, jeez. So Philadelphia's brotherly love, we talk about all three of those, we know those three, we can, we can see and taste and touch and, and experience those three, but that fourth one, the fourth one that's woven through the fabric of scripture is agape. And that agape love is a, is a love that, that is never, ever, ever about the person you see in the mirror. The love that God tells us to have for one another is not in any way, shape, or form a love that that has anything to do with you. It's for you, but it's not about you. Agape love is always about the other person. It's always others-focused. It is always seeking the best for God and other people. It is always love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it never asks what's in it for me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. But what does that look like? What does that mean? What does it mean that that love is from God? How do we love one another that way? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. If you have been born of God... We talk about this with with baptism. If you've been born new by the waters of baptism, you've been welcomed into God's forever family. You've been adopted and you've been brought in not because of anything you've done, not because of a choice you've made or some magical incantation that you can conjure up in a prayer, not because of any action or form or function you can do. 
but because God chose you. God chose you before the foundations of the world. Romans says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, when we could not be farther from God, God reached his arms out and he gave us a big old hug and he says, I love you, my child. When we backhanded him and spit in his face, he says, I love you, my child. When we drove nails into his hands and we tried to kill him, I love you, my child. You ever experienced that kind of love? Have you ever experienced the kind of love that says, I don't care what you do to me, I will love you? That's God's love. That's the love God has for you. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God genuine, real, authentic love, the love that's found in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. It's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not boastful. It doesn't focus on me at all. It's always you. It never asks what's in it for me. It's always how can I serve you more? How can I do the things that will bring joy into your life as I bring you closer to Christ? For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. If you want to know God better, love better. If you want to be closer to Christ, seek ways to love others more intentionally, more fully, more authentically. And then John tells us, anyone who does not love does not know God. If we, if we don't have love as the motto for our lives, if our mission statement as Christians in this world isn't to love God and love our neighbor, then we are not of God. Why? Because God is love. God has many, many attributes, things that we give to God, things, things that define, not we give God, things that we, we use to define who God is and how he operates. God is sovereign. God is, is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God, God is omnipresent. God is, is, is light, and God is life, and all those things. But do you know the one that undergirds every single thing in all of scripture, the one that gives all those other attributes meaning, the one that gives life to every other thing that defines God, it's the fact that God is love. It's the one thing that God has that that no other no other religious entity can ever have. God is perfect love because God is triune. God is one but three. He's Father, He's Son, He's Holy Spirit, and yet one God. And the Father loves the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Son loves the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit loves the Father and the Son. And from the beginning, from before the beginning, they exchanged a perfect, holy, and healthy love for one another. God is love. That has, God has to be triune. God has to be three and one and one and three. He has to be or else he can't be the epitome of love because love is relational. Love is not just about you. Love is about you in fellowship with other people. God, God says that he is love and we're supposed to love him but love one another too. Notice that first time love was mentioned in Genesis 22. It was the love between, between Abraham and his son. It's relational. It's an exchange between two people. Take your son whom you love. God says, he says that he is love. He defines our love. Unfortunately, we have flipped the subject and the object of that sentence and made feeling love our God. We have made feeling like we're loved some sort of God. Instead of saying God is love, we live our lives like like love is some sort of God. I didn't get roses on Valentine's Day. I didn't get a card for this. I didn't get this for that. It's No, that's not it. Love isn't the, the, the squishy stuff. Love, that, that isn't it. Because if that's the point, then love has become your God. 
Love isn't about you. Love is about you for somebody else. Love isn't what can you get. Love is how much can you give. Love isn't, but I thought, I, I, th- I thought it was about me. No, no, no. Love is never about you. Love is always how can you serve and love and shower the other person with something that will allow them to experience love, not you. Love has never been you. It's always been the other. That's God's love. Any kind of love that is not that is not God's love. In this The love of God was made manifest. You want to see what love looks like in real time? Do you want to know what it looks like when to experience it, to see it, to watch it play out in a in a in a real life made for made 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 for TV movie? Not really, just kind of a made for life kind of a deal. You want to see this thing in flesh and blood right in front of you? In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. How? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love is not about the giver, it's about the receiver. If love is about you as the giver, it is not God's love. Remember in the garden, in the garden, Jesus, not the garden of Eden, the garden of Gethsemane, Right before Jesus dies, he's, he's down on his knees and he's praying and he's sweating blood and, and it's an awful moment and he is just torn up and wrecked in his soul. And he says, Father, this is not what I want. I don't want to do this. But I will. I will. I will give up what I want. Do you think Jesus wanted to leave the glory of heaven and come live with people like you and me? Sorry, maybe he wanted to live with you, but he doesn't want to live with me. God, Jesus did not want to leave the golden streets of heaven and all the things that Revelation 20 through 22 talk about. He did not want to leave the perfection of the greatest place ever known to humankind on the other side of eternity. He did not want to leave that place to be whipped and beaten and mocked and spit on by the very people who said, oh yeah, I love you. He didn't want it. He prayed so hard that God would take it from him that he sweat blood. It is a real physiological phenomenon that you can sweat blood. He was that intense about not wanting to die. I don't want this thing. But Father, it's not about me, is it? It's about them. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll die for them. This is, this is why you sent me. Not because I chose to, but because I will willingly do it. Because it's for them. Do you see what it is? In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that the Son of God, not wanting to leave the glory of heaven, would willingly go and die in your place so you didn't have to? I mean, how much more love can you get? How much more loving can you get than a God giving up all that is his possession and dying an awful, horrendous death so that you and I could have everything that was rightfully his? That's love. Beloved, let us love one another because God is love. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He was the cleaner. He came in and cleaned house. He washed away our sins. He gave us a brand new lease on life. He took everything that we should have had, carried it on his back, nailed it into his hands, stabbed it into his side, pierced it into his brow, and he died. So that you don't have. Jesus' love was never about him. Now, lest you think, I know, Blaster, but I'm just a human. I can't love like that. Really? 
Really? Do you know what we do you know what we do in the waters of baptism? Do you know what we say in, in the baptismal rite? What we say over there when we baptize a child is that they take on the very name of Christ, the very identity of God is infused into you. Don't you dare use I am a sinner as an excuse to not love. Don't you dare say that I'm not perfect, so I can't do it. Don't you dare because you just dismiss the power of God in your life. Don't you dare, because otherwise we need to rip first John out of this Bible. Because Jesus doesn't say, well, in the days that you're being a very good Christian, can you please love one another? Jesus is not excusing bad behavior. Jesus says, okay, you don't love well. I get it. I'll show you what it looks like. You have a hard time putting other people first. Okay, I'll show you what it looks like. You have a hard time not thinking about yourself. Okay, I'll show you what it looks like. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because God is love. Love is not God. If love is God, it's always about you. But if God is love, it's always about somebody else. That's what Jesus did. Jesus showed us from his very actions, from his life, his death, and his resurrection, that love is never, ever about the giver. It's always about the receiver. Love is never, ever about the one who is giving. It's always about the one who is receiving love. You're not feeling loved? Then focus on loving somebody else more. You don't have all the feel-goods? It's because you're focusing on the wrong person. Love isn't about the feel-goods. Love is about the giving to somebody else. Today we start our May marriage challenge. And and in that, we're going to ask you to love somebody else, your spouse in particular. If you're not married, fine. Love somebody else who's not your spouse. I don't care. Just don't love them like they're your spouse because that gets really weird. And pastor didn't tell you to do that. Don't do that. Love somebody else. You don't have to have the erotic kind of love to love somebody. Do the agape love. Put somebody else first. Make it be about them. Show them how much they mean to you. Elevate them over you. Serve them however you can. Open your arms to die for them. Not literally. I'm not asking you to like, step in front of a car or like, nails in the hands and whip them on the back. But literally, literally put yourself last and, and put them first. The word joy. You, you ever want to know what joy is? You want to know what joy feels like? Millie taught me this. What joy feels like, Jesus first, others second, yourself always last. Joy. If you get them backwards, it's yoge. Don't be a yoge. She didn't say that. I came up with that one on my own. Anything that's not really smart came from me. So, joy. Be, be, be joy. Be joy filled. Jesus at the center of all that you do, others surrounding you in all that you do, and yourself at the very, very last. That's love. You want to experience joy? Give love. You want to experience joy? Give love. You want to experience being a yoge? Put yourself first. And you'll never, never, never know what love is until you put Jesus at the center and others next and put yourself last. Love is always about the receiver, never about the giver. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, you have demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, enemies of enemies, enemies of you and your son, you you sent him to die for us. You sent him to do something he didn't want to do and he did it willingly, that we might have life. Father, help us to experience that love and then shower other people with that love. Lord, may our love be others-focused and never self-gratifying. May our love never ask what's in it for me. But this is what I learned from thee. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.